Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Sally Pinto and I'm from the Yonkers North, neighborhood naturally occurring retirement community. We launched back in January of 2020 and we're here to serve seniors 60 plus in Northeast Yonkers. We have lots of fun programs and activities and we also have a lot of resources for you as well. Our programs include meditation chair yoga, uh, body mind fitness, bingo, and any other programs that you might be interested in, like arts and gardening. We have our resource specialist, Alexa Smith, who can help you with finding services and activities out there for you, as well as our nurse, Barbara Simone, who can help answer your health-related questions. We're here for you, we're here for our community, and we look forward to seeing you in our programs. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. I'm Alexa Smith, the resource specialist with the Yonkers Mark. I'm here to help with application assistance, referrals for home delivered meals, and transportation services will be coming soon. We also um, offer Zoom activities and Zoom programs. And if you have any other questions or concerns, I'm here to help. Thank you so much and enjoy the program. Welcome, I'm Barbara Simone, registered nurse. I recently retired from Westchester County's health department as a public health nurse. I am now here to try to assist you with any medical, or preventive care issues. Enjoy this program and I'm looking forward to working with you. Hi, welcome. My daughter is gonna help me put this on the screen so you can see uh, our presentation. Um, but I'm gonna start by telling you I was a public health nurse. So this is a little bit after my heart, uh, making sure people are vaccinated. All right, so my overview today is gonna to be on keeping our immunizations up to date. You know, we need vaccines throughout our lifetime. Um, we have found that there's more than 20 life-threatening diseases that have now been um, how we protect against by vaccination. Vaccinations have saved millions of lives globally. As adults, unfortunately, we are at risk for many preventable diseases due to lifestyle, travel, health conditions, um, and age. Um, because unfortunately, as we get older, our uh, protection Diseases as well as vaccinations can wane because our, I mean, our ability to fight things off isn't as strong. So vaccines have helped eradicate smallpox in the last 60 years. I didn't realize that when I, until I did research. It helped with eradicating polio, which I did know about. Um, it has decreased the death rate of measles by 73% since 2000 and 2018. It has been showing to decrease the uh, incident of rubella, which is the German measles, by 97% since 2000 and 2018. But um, unless we keep on getting vaccinated, um, we can see a recurrence of these diseases because most of them have, are no longer a common problem in our society. But if we don't keep the vaccination going throughout the world, there's a good chance. Um, Immunizations that I'm going to talk about today will be the flu shot, which is influenza. And then I'm going to talk about pneumonia, shingles, and I'm going to talk about the Tdap, which is tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussin, hepatitis A, and hepatitis B. I'm going to really central in on the flu shot in regards how we created it and how we moved on through it, where we started years ago, and now what shots we're using. This all has to do with the technology of how shots are designed, because I want you to understand, no one likes shots, but we're going to need a shot for the COVID-19 pandemic. And the influenza is really the one place that we have done so much research, get, getting a larger population immunized. Um, the influenza, um, there are um, three that are licensed in the state, the United States, by the CDC. We have a live attenuated vaccine have an inactive flu vaccine and we have a recombinant. I'll get into more details on what that is by technology. Um, we also have trivalent and quadrivalent. These are just words. I'm gonna explain them a little bit more detail. There's really no prevent preference of what to use. It really has to do with the community, your risk, your age, um, and things like that. 
Um, trivalent means that there's three strains in the uh, influenza that may be valid for that season. So if the doctor's using a trivalent, he's only giving you coverage for three particular viruses that might be in, in the seasonal. Quadrant is really what we're seeing more use of. Quadrant is more what we're used to. Um, and um, it is uh, four ingredients, four strains of influenza. The, uh, again, the difference of how we, uh, what we use is because of age, but it also how we produce them, okay? So basically the uh, US Drug Administration has approved three different methods in this country. And I'm gonna start with the egg-based, and I'm gonna talk about the cell-based and recumbent. Um, and the, how, how we want to egg base is where we really started with the um, influenza. And it starts with the World Health Organization. Get it in it. Ah. World Health Organization. Yeah. Um, the World Health Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System, which the CD is part of. They identify what we call candidate vaccine viruses, um, which is the current flu strain that's common, and there's four of them that's common throughout our season, come upcoming season. They take these viruses and they give them to a manufacturer. The manufacturer then puts them into fertilized egg cells. They incubate them for several, repeat the um, cycle of the virus. They collect it um, and um, they then either inactivate it, which we got the inactivated, or they weaken it, which is the uh, attenuated influenza, which is the live, that's the nasal spread. The attenuated is actually where we started out with flu shots. That's why people um, used to get maybe sick after having a flu shot. And that was over years ago. We've now gotten into this inactivated. And this is where we're getting um, prevention from getting sick from it because it's just the antigen or the body's ability to build an immune system against it. Unfortunately, this process caused a lot of, um, could not be given to a lot of people because they had egg allergy. It was a contraindication. It was harvesting eggs, and that's why it was a contraindication. So we needed to still immunize some of these people. So now we get the uh, cell-based flu. Um, the uh, cell-based flu started um, based, it was started, was approved by the FDA in 2012. Um, it is a faster startup. Um, it didn't rely on um, eggs, actually. Um, Eggs now became a precaution, not a contraindication. The reason it was a, um, a precaution is that unfortunately our startup viruses, the candidates that we identified for the season, some of them were still grown in eggs. Um, and there was like one strain in particular that we kept on doing. In 2000, um, August 31st in 2016, um, the FDA approved one company to actually have these grown in um, cells only. So we're starting to get non-vaccines um, that are not started in eggs. Um, so same process, I'm not gonna go into details, but it's the same process. Again, the CDC identifies what's gonna be common for the year. And these, uh, cell, these viruses are then um, put into um, mammals, mammal cells instead of eggs. And they replicate them. Same thing, we continue uh, to pull out the fluid containing the, uh, the antigen, the virus antigen, which I'll get into better detail on that. And um, then they, they create the vaccine. This actually, um, cell-based manufacturing is really what we make in inactivated flu shots now. So we're no longer really using um, the live. Um, Prior to, uh, to the 2019, I, I think I already mentioned this, that we had uh, some of them were originated for eggs, the beginning cells, and, and now we're starting to have ones that are not even started in eggs anymore. Um, so we go to the recumbent that flu vaccine, and this is a vaccine that actually you're going to see a lot more of other vaccines have recumbent. You're going to see me say the word recumbent through it, but basically this process doesn't require um, flu virus or chicken eggs. Um, so the candidate viruses are no longer needed. Um, it's not depending on egg supply. So if there's a pandemic and an egg shortage at the same time, we can still produce um, this vaccine, especially the flu. Um, it's also not 
um, how do you say, because it's not using live viruses, it's not um, dependent on the viruses because unfortunately these little viruses are very smart and they mutate very quickly. So what we have in the lab isn't, how do you say, what we have out circulating in the population as the sickness. We wanna close that gap. And this is one way we had closed the gap. Uh, recumbent vaccines was approved in 2013. Um, it basically get, does away with the candidate vaccine virus. And we are now using a synthetic DNA, which is a genetic instruction for making a surface protein called hemoglutin. I can't say that word, but it's an HA ant antigen. This antigen actually triggers our immune system. So it's just a little more complicated. It creates the antibodies specific for the virus. And they combined this with actually another virus called a bacovirus. This bacovirus is, doesn't bother vertebrates, which is what spines, it's invertebrates. They combined this and this is why it's called a recomb recumbent vaccine because it was combined there. The bacovirus actually helps the uh, DNA instruction to create the uh, antigen in host cells, which we can then um, replicate and uh, the FDA can then pull out and quickly um, create um, the vaccine. All right, so guess what? We now have all this opened up the population. We started seeing our 65 and older, we're getting the flu shot, normal flu shot, but they weren't, they were still getting sick. And I, I can get into the research, but basically it came out that we realized 65 and older, again, our immune response system for vaccine um, wasn't the same. So we needed to find a way to have that efficiency of our flu shots work for 65 and older better. And research showed this. So now we have different vaccines for 65 and older. And they, right now in the United States, we have a quadrivariant using an adjuvant and we have a quadrivariant high dose influenza. And I'm gonna explain the difference of the two. Adjuvants are actually something that's added into the vaccine. They've been used for decades. They're used in a lot of um, vaccines, not just flu. They're safe. They're an ingredient that creates a very stronger um, response system to the, the virus or the what we're trying to protect you against. Um, it, they use less of the antigen, um, which means we have a larger um, supply of vaccine because of it. Um, but the only problem about the antigen that people don't realize is that they might be causing the local reactions that you see with vaccines, such as uh, swellness and redness at the site, um, at the injection site. But they are also another thing that people don't realize is everybody, even now, I still hear people saying, oh, I got the flu after uh, I got it. They may have had a little symptom, uh, what you call systemic reaction, which is fevers, chills, and body aches. Unfortunately, the adjuvants are the ones that cause that. Uh, one of the adjuvants that we have um, in the flu is an MF59, and it's just basically a plant and cell naturally occurring in the body oil based emulsion, but that's but basically it's been used safely. Um, and actually in Europe, adjuvants have been used in the flu vaccine since 1997 and in the United States since 19, 2016. Um, so high dose quadrivariant is uh, a different shot. There's only one available. And basically it doesn't have adjuvants. What it has is it's taken the antigens of the four viruses and it's doubled it. So most people in the population get one, get the four, just simple. And then 65 and older will get a double dose of the uh, four antigens in the vaccine. So this helps to create a stronger thing. There's only one, as I said, in the United States licensed right now. That's probably going to change with competition. Um, and basically, we've all heard this twin double epidemic flu and COVID-19. Basically, getting the flu shot is more important this season um, than the, um, excuse me, is more important this season um, because we want to decrease the strain on the healthcare system. 
even though we may not see as much flu because of the precautions behind COVID-19, mask wearing, hand washing, distancing, doesn't mean you still can't get the flu. We also don't want people, you know, we don't want people getting the flu because it puts them more at risk for the COVID as well. So basically, you just want to get the flu vaccine. Um, and basically, um, flu should be given for people from six months and older. Um, the CDC is a great place to find a lot of information about it. It'll tell you what shots are available. So that's all on the flu. And some of the information I gave you really goes with the next information about the other vaccines. So I'm gonna start with the disease of pneumonia. Um, basically, we all know it's a, it affects the lungs, both, sac, both um, sacs of the lungs or it could be about one side. It causes um, a cough and it phlegm plus, and it's not just affected by bacteria. Virus and fungi can also co cause pneumonia. So pneumococcal disease, which is basically, whoops, sorry. Pneumococcal disease is very common in young children, but older adults are really the one that gets seriously ill, Ill and death. Um, of course, vaccines protected. They have, um, shown that at least one dose of the PEVNR, which is being announced on TV, has at least um, eight to 10 babies from serious infections called evasive pneumonia disease. Um, 75 to 100 adults, 65 and older against it. And I'm just gonna say that even the part, uh, one dose of the um, pneumonia polysaccharide vaccine has protected 50 to 85 of healthy adults against the new invasive pneumococcal disease. So, so again, adults age 65 and older face an increase of pneumococcal disease um, due to our natural related decline of influenza. The vaccines are great, just to let you know, but they don't protect against every single pneumococcal, okay? Um, the the Pevonar is uh, 13, protects against the most common serious infection in children and adults. So this one is used for all age groups. Um, and adults only need to get one single adult dose in a lifetime. Um, as we get older than 65, um, doctors may give you pneumococcal, pneumovax 23, which covers 23 variants of the pneumococcal bacteria. Again, you only need one single dose. Um, and 65 and older, again, as I said, with single dose. But there are some adults who are getting it again in five years. It really depends on chronic illness and it should be something you discuss with your healthcare provider. Um, and there are some conditions that the CDC does recommend that they get a booster of the pneumococcal. But again, general population should really get one single dose and people over 65, may get a booster um, of the uh, Pevonar, uh, not the Pevonar, but the Pneumovax 23. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next disease, shingles. Um, nearly all adults 50 years and older carry the inactive chickenpox. Yeah, we had chickenpox as children. It's called aerosol zosterous, medical term. And what happens is that virus lays in our body on a derm cell, and it actually can reawaken and be reactivated. And it's called shingles or herpes zosteris. If anybody's had it, they know how painful the blisters are and how a rash can happen. And it just can be very a pain, very painful in the nerves. Um, it usually affects older adults or people who are immunized, compromised um, because of our weakened immune system. Um, but it can also cause chronic situation, it can cause debilitating pain, can linger, the rash can linger, and, it, um, and less common side effects can be the eye um, with rare loss of vision and scarring and prolonged pain. Shingles is not contagious. It can be passed from one person to another only um, by giving the chicken pox to somebody who's never been vaccinated or um, somebody who's never had the disease. So basically um, 12 months and under, if you, have shingles, you don't wanna be near that person, that child, that infant, uh, because they're not vaccinated until they're over 12 months. Um, 
And the only way you can pass it on is if you have fluid. Once it's blistered, it crusts over, you, you are not contagious. You cannot pass shingles on to another person. You pass only the chickenpox virus. And whether they come are exposed to it, that's is if they have had a vaccine. Shingles can, the shingle vaccine can reduce what we call post hepatic neurology, um, which is PHN. And one out of three people will get chicken pop, uh, shingles in their lifetime. And of course, the vaccine can prevent that. There are two types of vaccines out there. And there is a zosterous vaccine, which is a live vaccine. And then there's a recombinant zosterous vaccine, Shinrex. The um, Shinrex is now the recommended advisory committee immunization practice ACIP uh, preferred vaccine. Because one, it can be given to people age 50 and older. It's given to immun immunocompetent adults. It was given on people who had the, the Zostervax. And Shinrex is a, it's actually a two dose series um, given one time, you know, one time you're finished. Um, so where uh, Zostervax actually had to be repeated in five years. Zostervax is no longer being sold in the United States as of July, 2020. Pharmacists and clinics still have Zostervax in stock, but um, they have to use the, the supply before November of um, 28, uh, 20, November 18th, 2020. Um, and it was used basically for 60 and older. It was the first line of defense. It was a live vaccine. We finally got a recumbent, which is a better vaccine and we get a better immunity. Um, and uh, people might get the ask if they had the Zosterax, they might be recommended to get the Shinrex. They did use Zosterax when Shinrex was low in supply uh, for people who are at risk for shingles, but um, they recommend those people to actually get the Shinrex as a replacement at this time. Okay, and now I'm gonna go into te tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussin. Um, basically, adults need to get their, what we call TD, tetanus and theria, every 10 years. Adults should also get a tet tetanus, diphtheria, pertussin vaccination at least one time during it. And I'm going to explain that by going into each little de um, disease entity a little bit here. Tetanus is um, not spread by person. Tetanus is a bacteria found in the environment. It's in soil, dust. It's all over the world and it's all over our environment. Um, what it does is stays in spores. It's a bacteria called colostrum, ten colostrum tendini and it enters our body um, by a puncture wound. It is not common in the US anymore, about 30 reported cases nearly yearly, but the cases among who get this are from people who didn't, didn't get the recommended tetanus vaccine. This includes people who never got the vaccine or who didn't stay up on their boosters. So it's really important to have, make sure your tetanus um, is boosted every 10 years. These are some of the areas that you can get it. Common things that you wouldn't take for granted, like a dental infection, insect bite. So, you know, that's why it's really important. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but it's really important to realize that it's there. It's really out there in the in our lives. Um, the incubation period for tetanus can be to usually between three to 21 days after exposure and an average of 10 days. However, it may range from one day to several months, depending on the kind of wound. Um, and immunization from infancy through adulthood is required. And again, every 10 years. Diphtheria, <clears throat> before the vaccine was introduced, was the leading cause of uh, childhood death around the world, including the US. Um, it's spread by person to person, usually respiratory droplets, um, it's like coughing and sneezing. Um, it can also get from infected wounds. It's something we, you know, we don't think about. Even I didn't, wasn't thinking about it till it. It's basically diphtheria is um, caused by a bacteria and it's a toxin in the bacteria that makes you very sick. Um, and unfortunately it's still um, around the world and they're, sorry about this, they're um, the disease, Globally, there has been about 16,000 cases um, that the World Health Organization has said. So it's still there. It affects the upper respiratory, but it also um, in breathing. Um, sorry. 
Diphtheria infection can cause weakness, sore throat, mild fever, and sore. It's actually the toxin, which I told you, kills the healthy tissues in the respiratory um, within two to three days after exposure. You get a thick gray coating, which is a pseudomembrane in, the, um, in that area, and it covers the nose, the tonsils, the voice box, the throat, making it very hard to breathe and swallow. Um, the toxin can also get into the bloodstream, such as the heart and nerve and the kidney. And again, diphtheria can be passed on from an open wound. Um, it's not as severe infection as the one in the respiratory. Um, and so basically that is why we give you tetanus diphtheria together. That is why that combination of the shots are done together and you get them every 10 years. Because yeah, it's not common here, but we still have people coming into the world who can bring this to us. Um, so now starting about whooping cough. Whooping cough, there is a viral, but there's also, this is bacterial one that we're really talking about. And unfortunately it's a highly contagious disease. It's easily spread. Um, again, it causes a de debilitating cough starting out. It's caused by bacteria um, and anybody exposed to it can get sick. People of all ages can get whoop whooping cough, but infants unfortunately are the most severe, get the risk of this illness and are, are really our main concern. They don't get shots till they're, you know, two months old. So that's why they're pushing to have um, adults make sure that their Pertussin is at least given one during their adulthood um, because they are a vulnerable population. The most common um, complications is weight loss, urinary incontinence, and syncope. Um, and it can last for a long time, whooping cough. It can last up to six months. Um, so basically what they did in the last 10 years is they've come out with whooping cough and who needs to be protected. So we're trying to go after pregnant women. They're actually giving that every time they get pregnant. Infants and young children have always gotten it. Preteens are now getting a booster of their Tdap because after the age of seven, unfortunately, that particular vaccine actually wanes. The pertussin part of the vaccine wanes. Um, it's just like tetanus and diphtheria have to be boosted. Pertussin needs to be boosted in our, in our adulthood. Um, and again, it's most dangerous. So if you are a grandparent of a very young infant or expecting, make sure you're you've had a Tdap um, before your grandchild is born or, or have, okay? Um, I'm now gonna just quickly run over hepatitis and this is the last of the two. Hepatitis is a inflammation of our liver. Um, it can cause by alcohol, toxic, um, and certain medical condition. So, but the most common reason that we have hepatitis is the result of a virus. Um, in U.S., the most common viruses are, uh, we have three, we have A, B, and C. Um, they're all short-term infections, but unfortunately B and C is the one that can actually become a chronic um, infection causing lifelong, lifelong infection. We only have two vaccines for the A and the B. C is not available at this time. Um, hepatitis basically um, is uh, spread by direct contact, food infected, and sewage. In Westchester County, we did have outbreaks while I was working there, um, West, where restaurants were actually the, uh, had a worker who spread it. Um, if you travel, hepatitis A could be a risk. You never know if you're around somebody. Children actually are asymptomatic for hepatitis A. So it is a very good one to um, make sure that you've had some type of um, vaccine for or talk to your provider. There are two types, but the one that I'm going to talk about right now is hepatitis A vaccine. Um, it's a single dose um, that you need two shots of. Um, in other words, you get one. Um, it will not give you a lifetime immunity. You need another shot six months later or beyond, um, and you will get a long, long term protection from the virus. The other um, product that's out there is a combination of hepatitis A and B, um, and that really is given to children, but some people do get it as adults because they, they're at risk for the B, um, hep, B, hep, hepatitis B. So hepatitis B, that's the one that you've heard. I actually am all, as a nurse, I was higher at I had a higher chance of getting it by job, hepatitis B as a nurse than I did HIV. Hepatitis B is a blood 
semen or other body fluids infection. So it's in who somebody who's infected. Um, it's actually a sexually transmitted disease. It's also passed on by sharing needles, syringes, drug infections, and mothers who are infected, who are asymptomatic, um, have the infection under control, can actually pass it on to their baby at birth. And we actually, in the um, federally as well as the state, monitor babies born to mothers who have who are H, um, HPV positive, hepatitis B positive, um, because they, unfortunately, 90% of those infants can actually become develop chronic infection, where if um, you're exposed as an adult, only two to six six percent of those people become chronically infected. Um, not everybody feels the, if they've been exposed to it, um, have symptoms, but symptoms can be fatigue, poor appetite, stomach pain, nausea, and the yelling of the skin. Um, and again, it's a cancer prevention uh, vaccine. Hepatitis B is actually cancer prevention for liver. Um, and the best way to prevent this is by having it. Again, there's uh, um, it, there's two types. There's a, either a three series or a two series. It really depends on what you need. Um, it has been safe since 1986. It's made synthetically, which I mentioned before in my thing, and it does not contain any uh, blood products. Um, and it it basically is a very safe vaccination. It is something I think all adults should really consider getting um, because we don't know where our lifestyles are. Everybody has unique, but it's a very good idea to speak with your, um, your uh, healthcare provider regarding this vaccine. Um, vaccines, again, are the most cost-effective healthcare interventions. Getting a shot is going to save life, but also save other people's lives. And it really does reduce the strain on um, our healthcare system. So it is one of the ways we're going to stop COVID-19 during this pan pandemic. Um, if people stop getting them, we will see a reappearance of vaccine preventable diseases across the world. So we really do recommend people get vaccine vaccinated and stay up to date in their vaccination and be aware that your body does wane as time. So it's always good to talk to your healthcare provider about that. Okay, I'm going to just, these are my references, but the CDC is where I got a lot of this information from and I hope uh, you uh, enjoy this now. Lucy is my daughter, she's a physical therapist and she is going to continue on with the speech. All right, so I am going to be talking about physical activity during, and wellness during a pandemic. Again, my name is Lucy Simone. I have my doctorate in physical therapy. Um, we are chatting about this during the pandemic. So uh, the first question is kind of how active should we be? So I think this is a very um, important question because a lot of times we don't always really know. So the American Heart Association guidelines for physical activity recommends 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous aerobic activity or a combination of both preferably spread throughout the week so you don't really want to get all of that in in one day uh, you want to really have a little bit more of a consistency throughout the week also it is recommended to have uh, moderate to high intensity muscle strengthening activity which can be in the form of resistance or weight training um, and and that's at least two times so studies show that an active lifestyle can be very beneficial on your health. So there's so many great health, health benefits, including a lot of these listed, lowering the risk of heart disease, stroke, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, dementia and Alzheimer's, several types of cancers, even complications with pregnancy. Uh, but it can also help with a whole slew of other things, such as sleeping better, better cognition, memory, attention. Um, it can help to uh, improve our <clears throat> our weight, um, decrease weight gain, improve our health in terms of decreasing the chances of obesity and um, related chronic health conditions that can come with that. can also help with bone health, help with our balance, which can help to decrease our risk of falling and injuring ourselves through that, as well as decrease symptoms of depression and anxiety, and overall just give us a better quality of life and sense of well-being. 
So in terms of being active, there's also a lot of other general wellness recommendations that are important to take note of because you can, you can be as active as you want, but if you're not having a well-rounded wellness, uh, you're not going to get the best benefit out of that. So it's also recommended that we get about seven to nine hours of sleep, that we have a well-rounded nutrition plan. So we'll have a variety of vegetables and whole fruits in our diet, as well as whole grains, uh, fat-free or low-free dairy, or low-fat dairy if you can tolerate it, uh, and as well as a variety of protein foods, uh, including seafood, lean meats, poultry, eggs, and nuts. Uh, additionally, hydration is a really big factor. So this is a key one that I talk to a lot of my patients about because when you're physically active, we tend to sweat, we tend to lose uh, fluid. So it's really, really important that we're getting that fluid back into our, our bodies throughout the day. So the recommendation for fluid intake is 11 and a half cups for women and 15 and a half cups of, for men of fluid per day. And I know that seems like a lot, but a lot of this fluid is not just from drinking water. You can get it through eating foods, uh, having soup. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get that fluid intake. Um, the biggest thing is that you're drinking throughout the day. Uh, so I always recommend having a water bottle, you know, something you can sip on throughout the day. Uh, I, I tend to recommend having some, you know, clear ones so you can kind of see as you're drinking, it kind of keeps you accountable. Um, and you can, you can make it fun, add fruit to it, add, you know, add flavors like lemon juice or drink seltzer that's flavored and zero calorie, just to kind of make it a little bit more exciting and, and a little bit less just bland uh, drinking water if you're not a big fan of just drinking cake water. The other thing is just keeping an eye out on your urine color. That's a big way just to kind of keep you, again, accountable for, am I drinking enough water? You should be looking for that light, pale, uh, yellow color. So just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, to get, make sure you're getting the proper hydration. What are the risks of inactivity? So this is kind of uh, going hand in hand of what the benefits are. Um, the risks of inactivity, there's a lot of different physical risks. So it, um, being inactive can increase your risk of heart disease, high blood pressure, even type two diabetes, a uh, couple of different types of cancers. Um, but it also can create an increased risk of weight gain, muscle loss, uh, decreased mobility and balance changes, which, which can then therefore lead to an increased risk of injury um, from falls, which can uh, cause hospitalizations or even early death. Um, additionally, there are some other risks in terms of inactivity. So mental health risks include depression, anxiety, loneliness, and even decreased motivation. So the a lot of uh, different ways that you can stay active during COVID. So I know right now we're mostly at home, we're trying to social distance, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still enjoy what we do and stay active um, and have fun with it. So I want to kind of go through a little bit of ideas and different things that you can try to do at home uh, and how you can stay active during COVID. So I'm going to go first through cardio ideas and then we'll talk about strength training and a little bit about balance and stability. So some easy cardio, socially distant uh, friendly ideas are walking, hiking, biking, swimming, um, and taking exercise classes such as Zumba. There are a lot of great resources online now uh, with the pandemic and just in general that you can access. Uh, YouTube is one I recommend a lot of people uh, to just because they have such a vast majority of, of uh, different classes and ideas, um, but two big ones that I recommend to people that are, are different sources of different exercise classes are Fitness Blender and Pop Sugar Fitness. They're two free online uh, YouTube channels, and they have a, an abundance of exercise classes, including uh, really great modifications and beginner level classes. To oh, my gosh. And then, so it's good to have a, a lot of different options for that, and I can give you a, a slew of more resources in that sense. Uh, to, for the next one, let's talk about strength training. So strength training is typically resistance or body weight exercises. So at home, if you don't have dumbbells or resistance bands, I'll typically recommend using like soup cans or jars of sauce, different things like that. You're, they're usually about one to three pounds and you can start kind of working up in terms of resistance training. For bands, sometimes people will have bungee cords they use at home, different things like that. But if you don't really have the resistance exercise equipment or you're not looking to use those kind of things, body weight exercises are really, really beneficial because they're more functional. Uh, they really help to allow you to move properly and help you prevent uh, injury in your regular tasks, which is really what we want to do. We want to stay active so we can stay healthy 
so we can keep moving, right? So body weight exercises are a really great way to keep it simple um, and, and kind of incorporate things we do throughout the day. So I'm gonna go through three different exercises that are nice and simple um, that kind of mimic some, some normal functional activities that we do throughout the day. So it's gonna be some sit to stands, which I'll talk about how we can progress into a mini squat and even a full squat, a kneel to stand, which I'll talk about progressing from a mini lunge to a walking lunge, and a seated chair push-up, which is more of an upper body exercise. So the first one is the you sit to stand. So this one, I'll typically sit at a chair that has armrests at a, a standard height. And what you're gonna do is essentially just stand up and sit back down. So you can do a re repetitions. I'll usually recommend starting with about a, a set of 10 of these repetitions in a row and starting with using your arms and then progressing to like this picture without using the arms. Uh, biggest thing is thinking about having your nose over your toes. You see in the, the picture in the second position, she's really leaning forward. So making sure that you're kind of using that um, momentum to try to stand up and then sit back down. And you can further challenge this by taking the chair away and just starting from a stand standing position and going into a half sit and even into a full sit. So that would be that uh, that progression into more of a squat. And again, starting with using your hands, holding onto a counter and progress to uh, no support at all. The next one is a kneel to slit stand. So this is one, it's kind of, again, like a mini lunge. You wanna start again, holding on to a counter or something you can that's nice and sturdy. So you can kind of feel, your, feel out your balance first and starting just going about a quarter of the way down to about halfway down. So this is a really great picture to start. Uh, and then you can even gradually progress it to no hands. And then I would, once you feel really comfortable with it without any hands, you can even progress to uh, trying to get that knee all the way down to the ground. Um, and then the next level would be trying to walk. So doing a step and lunge, and then the next step would be another lunge. So these are really good ones you can do, no equipment needed, and it gives you a really great challenge for your legs and even your, your trunk and core. And then the last one I'll show you for strength training is a chair push-up. So again, you just need a standard chair with armrests. Um, you're just at having your hands right on the, the armrest and you're just pushing yourself up. Now the goal of this is it's an upper body exercise. So the goal is to put as little weight on your feet as possible. You wanna be engaging your core. So trying to pull your belly button in towards your spine and then just pushing your arms, uh, your hands off that armrest, trying to push yourself up. And this can be progressed too by going into a lower chair or even stepping your feet gradually away from the chair to really add some um, progression into your core. So the next section I'll be talking about is some balance and stability recommendations for things you can do at home uh, to help challenge your balance a little bit, help prevent your, uh, your risk of falling and again, help prevent injury. So we'll talk about some standing marching, uh, standing straight leg raise, a tandem stance, um, which I'll go through what that means in tightrope walking and then a single leg balance. So the first one is a standing march. So I, again, I always recommend with any balance activity, you want to start on a flat surface, shoes on with a counter in front of you. I'll usually recommend having a chair nearby just in case you need to sit or rest or if you feel like you're unsteady with these exercises. Um, so starting with that, we're just going to be lifting up one foot and then lifting up the other foot. So alternating marching. Um, and I like to really think about keeping the hips in place. So keeping the hips even, keeping the shoulders even. So it shouldn't be like you're moving everywhere around. Uh, I always call it the penguin walk. You wanna really try to just lift up one leg and then the other. It's a really great way to work on coordination and control and challenge that single leg uh, stance. Um, and this one, again, you can progress with all of these. You can progress from that flat surface to standing without holding on. You can do eyes open and eyes closed. That'll make it a little bit harder. Sorry, it's a little bit sensitive. <laughs> um, and also you can add uh, a pillow under you or fold up a yoga mat just to change the terrain that you're standing on, which can make it a little bit more of an uneven surface and challenge your balance more. The next one is a standing straight leg raise. So standing again, starting holding on, you can do three specific directions, forward, side, and then back. Again, the big thing is keeping those hips even and just kicking the leg. The faster you kick the leg, the harder it's gonna be or the more challenge to your balance you'll have. So uh, a quick kick with the leg is gonna be a little bit more challenging because it kind of uh, jolts you around a little bit and it forces your core and your trunk to, to work harder. And again, you can progress these, uh, like I was just saying, add a pillow to stand on or close your eyes and that can really make things a, a lot harder. <laughs> 
Uh, the next one is a tandem balance. So you can do this in two separate ways. So static would be just standing with one foot in front of the other. Uh, again, starting holding on, trying to just hold that. You can progress this in place by even closing your eyes or adding an upper body activity. So like raising your arms up overhead because you're going to be moving. It's going to force your trunk to move a little bit. Uh, or even taking a ball and playing catch with somebody or throwing a ball against the wall. So there's a lot of different ways to make it fun creative without just standing in one place. A lot of times I'll have people practice this while they're in the kitchen doing dishes or cooking. It makes it a little more, more functional and you can do it kind of while you're, you're busy with your other tasks. Uh, and you can progress this to a walking activity. So just walking one foot in front of the other, like you're walking on a tightrope. And this can be done, you can use, you know, a line of tape or, you know, your tile surfaces at, at home to kind of walk and try to stay along that line. And again, progressing it with eyes open versus closed. Um, and you can even try forward versus backwards. And backwards is a tough one. So just make sure that you're uh, keeping that in mind <laughs> when you try it out at home. All right, and then the last balance exercise is just a basic single leg balance. Um, and this is kind of a progression of the march because you're just holding that uh, position. So again, same thing, you can progress this just from hands on something to no hands, to eyes open and closed, to you know throwing a ball against the wall. And just really to, to really challenge that single leg position, which is really, really important because there's so many functional activities that we do in single leg stance, like walking and going up and down the stairs, that we really want to try to maintain that control um, and try to keep ourselves a, as a stable as possible. So uh, on top of all of these fun, exciting things that you can do at home, just keeping in mind, your mind uh, out on general wellness. I just wanna give you a couple things, just to pointers to think about as well uh, in other aspects of wellness. So Barbara touched upon a lot of great information for vaccines. So just keep in mind um, that these are just as important at, as staying active because it helps to get that, that wholesome whole be well-being um, and keep you healthy. And, and do keep in mind too, when you get a vaccine that just like Barbara was saying, the adjuvant can sometimes increase your soreness in the arm. You know, a lot of times like, well, I got my flu shot this year and my arm was sore for about a day. And something that you can consider is actually movement can help reduce some of that soreness and even help increase the immune response. So keep that in mind that being active will actually even help with some of the other stuff that you're getting like the vaccines and the medications you're taking. On top of that, just in terms of hydration and nutrition, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, I personally recommend the cdc.gov page just for uh, general resources on, on those two topics. And then for mental health, which again is something that's a huge topic right now, there's a lot of great resources out there for um, accessing different things online that can help manage mental health uh, disturbances right now. So Headspace is one that I recommend to a lot of people. It has a lot of great meditation videos and different uh, resources that you can access for free right now. It's an app that you can get on your phone or find online. Uh, and then I know there's uh, some great resources that are being provided, the Meditation Chair Yoga Zoom class and the Body and Mind Fitness Zoom class, which if you don't know any information about, uh, feel free to ask Barbara, Alexis, or Sally about. So in summary, do what you enjoy, being active, it, you know, it should be fun. It's not something that you want to dread every day and <laughs> doing. So find things that you enjoy, find things that are fun for you, something that's gonna keep you on track and, and help keep you consistent because consistency is really key here. Um, one thing that I recommend for a lot of people is to keep track of your healthy changes. So keep a food log or keep a workout log because that's gonna keep you accountable. And also it's gonna help you see the little changes, you know, see how, much you could walk one day or how many exercises you can do or something like that, just to kind of keep an eye out on, on how you're doing it and see how your progress goes. Um, a lot of times too, I'll, I'll have people buddy up or even if you're you know not going and doing something with them, uh, just use a friend to hold yourself accountable, you know, tell them what kind of exercise you're doing or what kind of food you're eating, just so you can kind of keep each other uh, accountable for, for the healthy changes you're making. And remember that progress takes time. So. Uh, be patient and you want to, you know, you want to slowly progress your activity. So don't think you're going to wake up tomorrow and run a marathon. It just, it doesn't happen like that. I wish it did, <laughs> but it's something that can take some time and you have to be patient and, and really kind of enjoy it. Um, but overall, yeah, be patient, have fun and uh, stay safe. All right. Well, does anybody have any questions?
That was Hi, great. That was great. Thank you, Barbara and Lucy. We have a number of questions. Let's start with the questions that, that we got previous to the, um, the workshop. Z, you have those questions. Yes, I do. Okay, so the first question that I have is just to talk a little bit, Barbara, since you talked about immunization, just the concept of herd immunity and how does that work in general? We don't need to have too many specifics like for which vaccination, but just understanding herd immunity and what it means. Okay, basically this is a nor uh, this COVID virus is a unique virus. In other words, we don't have any way of protecting our bodies. The human race has never seen this before. So um, where herd in immunity comes from, we've had like smallpox as an example. We, we built up a herd immunity in some ways to that because other animals had it and we were able to do it. Um, and then we found a way to vaccinate against it. Um, so people get a herd immunity with colds and stuff. So not everybody gets sick with the common cold. COVID-19, unfortunately, is an example of um, something that our bodies have never seen, the human body has not seen. So the human body didn't know how to respond to this. Um, and it's gonna take a while to get a, um, a herd immunity, which means that me sitting next to my daughter means that I might have some immunity to it um, and she could still pass it off to me, but my body would say, oh, I've seen you before. I've seen something like you before. Let me just get rid of you. Where right now COVID, my body says, you are totally new. We do not know who you are. Where did you come from? That's what herd immunity means. You know, it's just like, um, which the COVID-19 is what was there. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yes, no, totally. We're really grateful for you to just giving us that framework to work with. So yeah. we're really grateful. Now we're going to switch tracks to Dr. Lucy for a question. Um, we have several people um, on the Zoom who uh, suffer from sciatica. So we're hoping that you could give us a couple of exercises to use that would help yeah. alleviate this if we wake up in the morning or as we're going along in our day and we're finding that it's peaking or acting up. How would you uh, suggest to, to deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just a little background on what sciatica is. It's essentially a symptom from your sciatic nerve that uh, runs from basically your tailbone down or can run from your tailbone all the way down the back of your leg to your heel. So sometimes people have sciatic symptoms in their back. Sometimes sciatica can actually even go down to the back of their leg. Uh, but essentially it typically is because of a tightness along those nerves. So the nerve tract, uh, that sciatic nerve tract is what can become tight and create some of those sciatic symptoms. So typically when you get the symptoms, I mean, it's not always, but a lot of times people get them because they're sitting for prolonged periods of time. So you're, when you're in that position, it can put a lot of stress on your muscles back there and just put more stress into the sciatic nerve. So a lot of times I'll just recommend simple habit changes like standing up every 30 minutes. You know, if you're sitting for a while, you're gonna be watching TV or you're sitting and working, just standing up and going into a couple back bends. So even just trying to get those hips forward um, and bend back a little bit will actually help to alleviate some of those symptoms. So that's usually the first thing I'll recommend is just trying to kind of incorporate that into your day. But there are a couple different stretches that you can do uh, specifically for the nerve and even the, the whole posterior chain, so the muscles going down the back of the leg. So um, I can actually, let me just position myself a little bit differently so I can show you them quickly. So I'm just gonna move this over here for a moment. So let's see. So one thing that you can do um, is, is just working on a hamstring stretch. Um, so if you're sitting for a while, trying to stretch the leg out and, and just bring the head down. So trying to just work about the back of the leg so you can bring your toes up and your head down. And this is actually going to help stretch along that full posterior chain. And then you can just kind of bring the foot up and down like this. And then relax. So it's essentially sitting straightening the leg and then bringing the toes up and down like this. And what that's going to do is that get that whole back of the chain and that whole sciatic nerve uh, tracked. So that can help to stretch the, the whole chain of the nerve. And then another way to just stretch the hamstring itself is just standing, putting the leg on a chair or on a lower surface and just reaching towards the foot. 
Wow, that's really great. And who knew that bending your head would have such, I tried it both ways just now. And who yeah. knew that, that bending your head makes it, it different? Yeah. So getting that whole stretch along, it's really the, the neural tract of your, your spinal cord that you're stretching, but it can help really to uh, promote a little bit more stretching along that nerve and that sciatic, um, help with the sciatic symptoms. So try it at home then, and if you have any questions, let me know. That is awesome. That is great. Thank you. Now we're going to switch tracks and go back to Barbara. We have a, a nursing question. Uh, somebody just had a blood test at the annual physical and they got a report saying that their triglycerides and that their um, sugar levels were a little high and they need to get retested in six weeks. So would you be able to make some recommendations on modifications for diet or you know what to do also with Dr. Lucy for exercise to help mitigate this because as we go for our annual physicals, as we try to get everything in before the end of the year, these things yeah. keep popping up. So any advice you have on that is great. All right. Um, so activity is really gonna help a lot with um, what do you call um, the blood work. But besides that, diet is important. Um, it's, we have a high carbohydrate diet in this country to begin with. So that, and that's where the sugars come from. Everything breaks down to sugar, but carbohydrates and the process it breaks down into sugar is actually what causes some of the triglycerides to go up. Um, and our bodies also, some of us produce high tri uh, triglycerides. They're just in our genetics um, in the way we break things down. So activity is really important. In other words, keeping your metabolism up helps to um, your body to break these down more correctly than storing them. Um, because if you don't burn off the sugar, you're going to store it, um, which is not good for the heart. Um, and there's a thing called what we, and this country sees a lot more of it because we're seeing a lot more adult onset diabetes in younger ages, is um, a metabolic syndrome, which is really um, our bodies predisposing to diabetes. Um, and it's because one of it's because of the fat, high fat in our diets um, part of triglycerides is a fatty acids and um, glycerol, which is sugar. So really watching your carbohydrate intake, you do need it, but you have to, you don't like, if really when they say a half a cup of pasta, you really should stay with that. I'm unfortunately, I'm married to an Italian, so it's tendency <laughs> to, <laughs> uh, but you know, keeping, watching your carbohydrate and making sure that you get the lean meats and you get the whole grains those things really do help. A nutritionist also would be somebody that would give you better advice, but um, overall, a balanced diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, and then watching the carbohydrates. You still need them, but to be very careful on how much you consume um, a day. Um, your intake for a female should be about 1,800. Um, if you're dieting, it could be a little lower. You don't want to go under 15 as an adult. Um, we should be about 18 for a female, 20 for a male. Um, but if you're active, then you're burning it off. So that's really what's important too. Great. That was really wonderful recap. We really appreciate it. And there's so many new interesting products available. Like they have veggie spirals now instead of pasta. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. Yes. There yeah. Sometimes making your own, you know, pasta like that is really good. Um, and then, you know, being aware, you know, like a lot of people have cut out breads. Yeah, it, that's, if you don't need it, don't eat bread, pasta with bread. I mean, it's very, I, she was in Italy and they, they're like, no, no, you don't have pasta and bread. Yeah, apparently <laughs> Italians don't eat pasta and bread, and bread. together. You know, something <laughs> that the Americans do, you know. So, you know, to be aware of that, you know, we do consume a lot of carbohydrates in our diet constantly. So, you know, and we don't probably get enough whole grains and whole um, looking at those and probably adding a little bit of that in your diet, um, you know, instead of, you know, like the whole wheat pasta is good, but, you know, maybe even having, uh, what's the, the dad, wheat berry, um, what's the other one, Was, uh, feral, quinoa, quinoa. Of all of those are great, much better for us, and they actually help decrease the uh, cholesterol and the triglycerides. That is awesome. Thank you for, for sharing those substitutes and those other options with us. Now we're going to move out. I should have done both of the, the stretching questions <laughs> at once. Sorry, Dr. Lucy. We're yeah, that's okay. 
there is a question about hamstrings with mm -hmm. the colder weather setting in and people less moving around because we're less apt to go outside in the fall with the cold and the rainy weather like today. Um, how can we give our hamstrings a nice little either stretch or workout? Yeah, great question. So uh, one thing that I didn't even really go into in vast detail in the presentation, but uh, one thing that's really important is a proper warm up for our muscles. So our muscles can get cold. Uh, so if we're gonna be active or we're gonna be moving around, uh, warming things up a little bit first. So that could be as simple as just sitting and marching in place or doing just a, you know, a five minute walk. Uh, before you do any stretching, I always recommend at least a little bit of a, a warm up or even, even, I mean, you can warm it up through uh, physically through like a hot shower or something like that as well. So you wanna make sure that your muscles are warm before you ever do any stretching. Um, but the hamstring stretches is, is kind of similar to what I was showing you in the position that uh, you can do a lot of different stretches for it. Uh, you can do a standing stretch where you just uh, put your leg out in front of you. So let me see if I can get you a little position. Um, put your leg out in front of you and then just reach down and try to touch it. Um, you can do your leg propped up on something and try to reach towards it. But the biggest thing is that you want to be, if you're stretching your hamstring, your hamstring muscle starts at your pelvis. So make sure that you're not leaning forward with your back. So I see a lot of people doing this when they, when they try to stretch their hamstrings, but just make sure that your everything from the waist up is just staying static. So as I lean forward, this area should stay pretty straight. You should feel a nice stretch in the, the back of the leg, typically from the buttocks reaching to the back of the knee. So that's a great way that you can just stretch and even just standing and trying to lean forward and touch your toes. If you try to keep your back straight again as you go down, that will get a nice hamstring stretch. But before you do any stretching, you always wanna make sure that you're keeping things warmed up and um, getting a little bit of loosening up of that tissue first. Yeah. I mean, even if you have a house, just walking up and down the steps mm -hmm. before you stretch is a good idea. Um, you know, or just walk at the hallway around is also very good. Awesome. This is really great. All right. Now we have a few more questions. We've been receiving some in the chat. So we're um, going to head back to the topic about uh, the flu shot. If someone has a cold, should they wait until they're over the cold before they get the flu shot? What is your recommendation? If they're, if they're just lingering at the tail end of a cold, no, get the flu shot. It takes two weeks to build an immune system. The only time really we don't want to give you the flu shot if you have, um, you're just newly coming down with it and you have a fever. Um, that's why they ask those questions. But um, you, you really, um, because of the prevalence of flu and when it's coming, what we're giving you with the four strains is you've got the early season and you've got a late season. So like I think hepatitis, uh, not hepatitis, um, the A uh, virus is more early fall and then and we go into winter. But then we've got another resurgence of a different strain in the spring, in, in the deep winter, spring. Um, so that's why the sooner you get it. And, you know, unfortunately, your cold, once you've got the cold, your body is just keeps on fighting it. When you put the shot in, your immune system is just up there. So um, I would tell people if they're going to have it when they're cold, just treat themselves well that the next two days. Keep active, but drink lots of fluid. Um, and your body is going to work. It's going to be happy. It's got this immune system going. So, um, and viruses, um, you know, what we use for the flu, sometimes some of that, your body's immune system uses the same mechanism. So it's already up and running. So getting the flu shot at that point will say, oh, I'm going to do better this time. Because <laughs> you're a new, you're a new army. We're going to get rid of you. So, okay or new enemy, you might say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barbara. That's great. We also have another question about immunizations and about timing. Is it okay to get the shingle shot at the same time as you get your flu shot? Because sometimes, you know, if people get two at a time, you can come down with these chills and nauseousness. So like sometimes people can be leery of, of getting all these shots at once. Yeah, the, um, no, it is good to get them at the same time. Um, your body is going to fight it off no matter what. You're going to get the immune system going. Um, as long as you're a healthy adult, um, it's actually, you're exposing yourself by actually going in twice when you don't have to. You know, remember a doctor's office is full of germs. So it's better to probably do have less visits and do the two shots together. 
than it is to go in there and expose yourself twice to do different types of germs. Um, so yes, the Shinrex is because it's a recumbent. Um, it's a synthetic type of thing. So at this point, yes, it's safe. And, and it's really, it's specific, it's building antibodies specific for that virus. And the flu shot is also part of the virus. So yeah, you can get them together and it's really okay. Um, even babies, think about it. Babies are getting like sometimes four shots, five shots at one time. Um, and if they don't, they're putting themselves at, we're putting them at risk for one of these preventable diseases. So that's why they're, they're trying to keep kids on a, a certain schedule. Gotcha. That's really valuable information. And thank you for clearing it up and pointing out to us that the more times we go out, the more exposure we get. So sometimes is like you said, better to just go once, get it all, and then mm-hmm. be home and then just acclimate and let our body do the work. Right. Shots. Right. And, and remember, whenever you get something in your muscle or something, you need to treat yourself just a little bit better. I got the flu. I, I got that shot. I'm going to treat myself to an extra candy bar today. No, <laughs> but, you know, drink some extra fluids, eat well, and um, take a nap. Yeah. Yes, Whatever take a your nap. body is asking for. Right. But don't go and flop on the couch for the rest of the day. You know, take a nap <laughs> get up and do some work, exercise, do some movement, especially with the, where the muscle the, where the shot was done. Because the more you move it, the more the body's able to absorb that and it's faster for the army to, as I would put it, your army or antibodies to build up and um, get a strong army against that. Right, and you won't get stiff because I know if like we hold our arm mm-hmm. in the same place where we got our shot and we don't move it, then we get a little right. stiff. Yeah. All right, that's good. Um, We do have a question for Dr. Lucy. We know that you had a great slideshow and we're going to be formatting the lecture um, to be on YouTube on the library's website so we can see those great slides that you shared. But someone's asking if they walk an hour daily until it gets, you know, they were doing this until it got cold with no weights. Is that enough? And it wasn't speed walking because, you know, they have a little bit of knee troubles. But what do you think about this as uh, a regimen and what can people supplement if they need to, if that's not enough? So it's definitely enough in terms of the uh, the cardio aspect. So um, like I had said from, at the beginning, the there's 150 minutes of recommended moderate aerobic activity uh, throughout the week. So that's that would be way past that if you're doing an hour a day. But there's also the recommendation to increase, include some resistance activity in your daily or in your weekly routine at least two times a week. So it doesn't have to be very long. You know, you can do 10, 20 minutes of resistance training twice a week. But some of the exercises I showed you, like the, the body weight exercises, the sit to stands, the mini uh, lunges, those are really good ways to build up that muscle strength and muscle endurance, which you're not going to get from just walking um, at a comfortable pace an hour a day. So you're still going to get a lot of really great cardiovascular benefits, um, and it's you, you're probably in more of like a fat burning phase when if you're walking at a comfortable pace. But you're not going to get the effects of the strength training that you would you would get from more of a body weight resisted or resistance training uh, approach to exercise. So I would recommend at least trying to implement those two day two times a week. Again, it doesn't have to be very long. I'll usually have people start with um, some general you know major body. Uh, major muscle exercises. So, you know, biceps and hamstrings, and you can do again, body weight squats, things like that, just to start implementing some strength training uh, two times a week. All right. And I have a follow-up to that, like from on a private chat from someone else who's listening to the wonderful things you're saying. They go to the pharmacy, like a CVS or whatever, you know, we have Walgreens, all Rite Aid, all these wonderful pharmacies. I don't want to favor one over the other. Uh, and also local independent pharmacies. And a lot of the times they have for sale um, these resistance training bands. What are your opinions on those? So those are great. Really, resistance is resistance. It can be uh, bands, you can do weights, you can, body weight is going to be more functional. Um, but you, a lot of people use like the resistance bands, they can you know, tie it around their feet and do uh, bicep curls, or they can put it around their knees and do sidestepping. So resistance bands, um, you don't need to go out of your way to buy anything super expensive. I'll typically recommend some cheap store bought uh, stuff for people to, to kind of just get things moving. But the biggest thing is that you're moving and that you're doing something that you enjoy. Um, and if you're getting a little bit of that, that muscle pull, that's, that's really perfect. 
Awesome. And then we have a question for both of you about snacking <laughs> and working out. Is it better? I know that we always say drink water and it's really important to drink water. And this person says, yes, they've been, they have a water bottle with them when they work out or when they walk or when they did the resistance training. But what about snacking? Like, as you know, the old adage, like, don't go swimming. You have to wait a half an hour for digestion. <laughs> you know, these little like myths or wives tales that exist. Can you like shed some light on when is the proper time to snack or eat before and after? after exercise, just to help us out a little bit? Um, we'll do both. Um, what I have read that it's really individual. Um, the stomach should be kept full a little bit. It does empty out in about three hours. Um, so having something light before a uh, half hour before you actually do a real heavy aerobic exercise is a good idea. But keeping your blood sugar up and keeping a rhythm is very important. You definitely do better. Um, exercise wise. Um, they actually, I've seen research show us that the afternoon exercise is actually better than first thing in the morning because your body's up warm and muscles have been moved, but also because you've, you've got your food, you've got your fast broken and you've got um, your metabolism going up. So I'm going to let yeah. her. So it, yeah, this is one of those uh, questions that it's very individualized. Mm -hmm. It is dependent on um, metabolism. It's dependent on how you know tolerable you are to after eating, how um, being active. But the general recommendation is that you don't want to eat a very heavy meal right before you exercise. So typically, if you are having, a, if you have a heavy meal or a large uh, meal, you want to wait about three to four hours before you're going to be doing, especially if you're doing any vigorous exercise or weight training, uh, moderate intensity activities you could you can do uh probably about an hour or so after a heavier meal but um but there is sometimes a recommendation especially if you're going to be doing more cardio based exercise if you're going to be getting the heart rate up and start kind of getting into your glycogen stores which is the um the storage that you use for for more of that aerobic activity then you do want to have at least a small snack before you get active so a lot of times like i'm a big runner if i'm going to be going for a run for more than 30 30, 30 minutes, I'll usually have like a, a little granola bar or banana before I go out just to get a little carbohydrates into me because that is the, the main storage or the main uh, thing you're burning for more of a, a cardiovascular workout. Um, for strength training, you don't necessarily need anything right beforehand. Um, but a lot of times uh, people will like to supplement with like a, pro a higher protein snack after their workout, after a strength training workout, because that can help actually increase your, um, your muscle strengthening and muscle mass after. But again, this is really a, one of those things that it depends on people. It depends on your individual goals. If you're trying to gain muscle versus trying to lose weight. Um, but you don't, you, and some people really like to exercise first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. It doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It's just what you can tolerate and what your body uh, prefers. Yeah, um, and the other thing I was gonna say is heavy meal, you actually, um, your blood pressure actually drops and a lot of your blood goes to the liver to do its job to digest. So that's something to take into. So a heavier meal would really cause that where a light snack wouldn't. And then really with the, um, the body also, when it first starts and the tablet starts up, in order to burn fat, you need a higher fire. So it's going to pull protein if you don't have some instant sugar on way to get that fire up. So in other words, you need some, I would call them twigs, you know, to keep, get the fire up there. Then you can put the log on, which is the fat to burn. So sometimes, yes, a little snack before a long cardiovascular will help that. So... This is great. I love the the back and forth between the both of you and you know the scaffolding of the answers and and the examples of the snacks. Um, now I'm gonna have a question about PT because of all the things that are going on in the with this pandemic. What are your recommendations for people who are leery of doing physical therapy in person at the office? Is it possible to do it virtually? Um, yeah. Or not? And what are your recommendations? <laughs> yeah. So. Um... I work in an outpatient facility. So um, typically, you know, people from the community come to us and it's honestly, it's been, I know it's, it's different for every facility, but it's been uh, a really great transition with, I mean, with COVID going on, we've been able to establish a telehealth system 
Um, and a lot of insurances right now are have changed kind of how they're allowing telehealth services because it's been such a big a big thing. People want to stay home because of COVID and and just stay safe. So telehealth is absolutely an option. Uh, it is something again. It's a facility facility basis, but it is something that a lot of outpatient facilities are are utilizing and they're using Zoom like this um, and and different services online where they can go through exercises and they do more uh, visual assessments. So you can even have your your uh, assessment uh, over the computer and they'll give you exercises on a weekly basis and they kind of go through a one-on-one -on -one session with them. So we, we've we been really implementing that at our facility and I know it's been across the board has been a big topic for physical therapy. So it's absolutely an option. It's one of those things that you, uh, you, know, you might have to look a little bit more into your local area. I'm not too familiar with what facilities are providing it uh, around you guys, but it is something that is, has been uh, very, very more, much more uh, approachable and there's a lot of resources for it right now. Right, and I have to tell you, telehealth has been there for a long time. We were not utilizing it as well as we're using ISIN now. And it's something that has been, you know, um, I know when I was, for the last 10 years, I know that we've been trying to get telehealth for especially for the elderly, um, because a lot of them are homebound um, prior to this, and it would have been nice to have the technology um, or have them have the technology to talk to their, you know, visually talk to a person, which is big help. So yeah, so this COVID-19 really did help bring this up, this technology that we've had available for quite a while. Yes, it's a silver lining. I always mm -hmm. like to look on the bright side yeah. and just find the mm -hmm. good in this situation. So you're right. Um, yep. Are there any other questions to ask our dynamic duo? Because this has been fascinating. It's 2.20 already. I know we said we were going to go for an hour, but we've surpassed our hour. But if there are any burning questions that people have, uh, please unmute yourself or type them into the chat. And Barbara and Lucy would be happy to answer. And if you have any questions for Sally or myself, <laughs> that's always good too. And I, I do have a question from someone saying, are we going to try to do this again? And <laughs> Sally, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> Are you available? Yes. Our, yes. our mother daughter team is available. We, and, we and only can do it on Mondays when she's off. Mondays and, a good day for you. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we'll say we'll have Marvel. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> once a month. You know, we can accumulate the questions and people can email them to Sally or myself ahead of time right. if, they want, if they, you know, they want a thorough, like thought out thing that you could do some research or we can ask them as we go along as it happens and you can use your repertoire of your knowledge that's. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I have a quick question. Can I ask yeah. A yeah, okay. So, you know, I had been going to physical therapy and they have specific machines. Yeah. So I guess what you're going to do is you're going to get around it and improvise, I guess, so to speak. Yes. Okay. Yes. We, we get a little creative with telehealth. So, I mean, the machines are great supplements, but they're not required for any specific thing. Uh, that's one thing that we definitely learn in school is to get creative with some, you know, different activities to keep you active. And if you're going to be doing it at home anyway, we try to give you something that you can continue to work on when we're not there too. And, you know, we're there to to help guide you through it, but then to help maintain it and make it actually something that you can consistently do for self maintenance, it's, it's better to be able to do it at home. So it actually works in, a, in our favor sometimes. Mm -hmm. And actually all our Zooms that we've been doing, mm -hmm. if you've noticed a lot of the exercises that she pointed out were a lot of the stuff that our body and mind Zoom does, the yoga does. Um, it's basically, it's all part of, you know, physical health in movement and the alignment of our bodies stuff like this she's the expert and they are you know um train you know personal trainers and um our yoga trainer all have helped us and they're all based on the same um same theories so we have to be creative in our home yes. and you know something if our activity level has to be something we enjoy i mean I actually saw exercises that she should you know was showing you and i'm like oh, I could do this when I'm doing this at the house, you know, <laughs> when I'm doing dishes, you know, I can stay active that way. Because, you know, I'm not a big gym person. I really don't like the gym. I do go out and I use to jog, I walk, but I really need to do some stretch, you know, how do you say strengthening exercises, especially balance. I don't do notice that I'm getting older. My balance is not as good. It's not as natural. Um, and I've noticed it with hiking that I needed to, you know, I need to start strengthening up some of my core. 
So having a daughter for a physical therapist <laughs> has helped a lot, <laughs> but it, I'm seeing a lot more and understanding a lot more. Well, thank you for sharing your daughter with us because we got to have you through the NORC and then by association, we get Dr. Yeah. <laughs> so it's one big happy family. Thanks to Sally and the NORC. And we're so blessed to have this, this opportunity, this grant. Um, you know, NORC has been transforming the way that we uh, come together, especially during this pandemic. So I want to give a big thank you to Sally and to the team. Yeah. Alexis and Barbara, and then by association, Dr. Lucy. So thank you. you. You're you always there for us. We have a lot of comments in the chat. Thank you both. This has been very informative. You know, kudos to mother-daughter team. <laughs> it's good. It's good. So we, we really do appreciate your time and attention and energy. And Sally, you know, it's phenomenal what you do with the limited amount of being able to have in person, the things that you've provided for our wellness community are, are astounding. So we really do want to give a big thank you to Sally. Thank you, Z. It's, it's really a team effort between myself, Barbara, and Alexis. And as you can tell, um, Barbara has a wealth of knowledge. She is available to our seniors. So um, please, if you know of a senior who needs um, more, more, more help from Barbara, more one-on-one, -on -one, we're here for you. And also if you need uh, an, uh, an, an idea on resources that are available out there, Alexis is available for you. So I'm sure um, one of these days, Alexis will have her own, her own workshop, uh, but we're working on it. But it's definitely, we love bringing these programs. And as I see, when I saw Lucy doing all those exercises and the balance, we do that every week. So please, if you haven't joined us, yeah. Um, for uh, the meditation chair yoga or the body mind fitness, join us. And we'll also put the um, links and, and it's out there on the YouTube channel for uh, Young's Public Library. Those are out there, but join us and you'll see for yourself the good, um, uh, the good exercises they're doing. They work on balance, they work on cardio and such, and they work on weights as well. So, um, and, they, you, and, and they let us proceed as where we're at. Not everybody's at the same level. As Lucy was saying, you start where you're at and just slowly build up. And that's what I hear in both the uh, both programs. They are like, start this way. And one of them was using cans, you know, and, and, and the balls and stuff like this. So yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. And this Friday coming up, we're gonna be using a balloon. balloon. So, yes. us. so we yeah. have a lot of health and education programs. We have a mammogram program tomorrow we, uh, with New York Presbyterian. And we have uh, uh, fun stuff like a gardening program starting on Wednesday. Um, we will send you all that information. So please join us for all our programs. It helps us both mentally and physically. Z? Yes, on that note, yes, please visit our website, www.ypl.org. We put most of our programs up there, or we should have all of our programs up there. And we're just grateful to everybody for spending a rainy afternoon together. This is a great way to get informed and to make sure that we are doing the best we can for ourselves and also for others. Because if you know your neighbors or your friends or your family members, you can always pass along this information and and share because sharing is caring and thank you once again to lucy and barbara and alexis and eileen and all those at the library z bear and we hope you have a great monday thank Thanks. you sally thank you everybody be well stay well and until we meet again via zoom <laughs> have a good day bye bye thank you bye bye, -bye. hi everyone this is z from yonkers public library Thanks so much to Sally Pinto and Alexis and Barbara from NORC. Thank you to our community partners, WJCS, the City of Yonkers Office for the Aging, Westchester County Legislator Ruth Walter, Friends of Crestwood Library, and Yonkers Public Library for making this phenomenal partnership. And we thank each and every one of you for being part of our wellness community. Be well, stay well.